Good morning, everyone, um, and thank you for joining uh, today's webinar. Now, my name is Gil, uh, joining me is Gaurav, and today we're going to speak about how machine learning and artificial intelligence is changing the future of uh, demand generation in B2B. Before we get started, um, just a few housekeeping items. So first of all, you guys may have questions. Uh, please feel free to type those questions into the Q&A um, box in the chat window. We'll go through all those uh, questions one by one once we, um, once we finish the, the slide share. Secondly, uh, a recording of this webinar will be sent to you via email after the end of this um, webinar, so you can watch it on demand and, and share it with your colleagues. And then finally, we will uh, spend one or two minutes um, talking about the giveaway uh, at the end of this webinar. It's a free dashboard and visualizations for your marketing program, something you can share with your executives, um, something very neat. We recommend that you uh, stay for that. Go out and walk, walk us through that. Fantastic. Just a, a few words about myself and Gaurav, my, my counterpart. Um, myself, I'm a software engineer uh, with artificial intelligence and robotics background, uh, about 10, 15 years uh, doing software engineering in that field, and then spent the last 10 years uh, running demand generation and growth hacking for a few B2B uh, companies. Gaurav, if you don't mind, perhaps you can um, give a few, uh, few sentences about your background as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me here today, Gil. Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Gaurav Saini. I am currently the head of growth at a company called Workspan. I have an extensive background in different functions of marketing and growth, where I've basically spent the last 10 years getting better at my craft. Uh, more recently, I've spent about four years in building and running a very data-driven and effective marketing and sales teams at uh, different SaaS companies. I'm very passionate about owning uh, the marketing-generated uh, pipeline and a firm believer that marketing's job is not just to create leads and, and MQLs, but to create qualified opportunities that we can hand to sales and, facil and facilitate sales at a much higher rate. Back to you, Gil. Thank you, Gaurav. Okay, so let's jump into our agenda for today. We're going to cover three challenges we think are um, very big in demand generation, and then the three solutions that we see are successful in tackling those challenges. So I'll just go through them one by one. The first one is not all leads are created equal. And what we mean by that is that when you generate, you know, hundreds of leads every month using your marketing mix, whether it's your trade shows, your, your outbound um, campaigns, your content marketing like this webinar, your ebooks, your SEO and organic, so on, so on, your paid ads, so on and so forth, you're generating many leads, but the vast majority of them don't actually convert into, into commercial business, into pipeline and into bookings. And so you have to really understand what the 2080 rule in your pipeline. The second one is the disconnected workflow. When you have uh, many different marketing stacks, different marketing tools that you're working with, Unless they're connected, it's very hard to optimize the entire process. And it kind of forces you to rely more on your intuition versus on the data that relies underneath. And then final challenge is how do you find a 20% lead that actually impact 80% of your pipeline in your business, kind of the Pareto rule. How do you find that hidden gem that impacts your business? We'll then jump into the solution part. Why do we think predictive marketing and programmatic advertising is a key strategy to win your business, to really build a predictable, successful pipeline? The second one would be how to reduce the signal-to-noise ratio. When you generate all those leads, the vast majority of them don't actually convert into, into booking, into pipeline. How do you remove that clutter from Salesforce? How do you make your SDRs and your sales counterparts uh, really utilize the leads that you're giving them because historically they've been working out for them and they've generated good pipeline for them. And then finally, we'll actually give two particular examples of how to use machine learning, data analysis, and statistical functions to actually find the top 20%, 15-20% of the patterns and experiments that you should focus on. 
So really how to run agile marketing in a very data-driven manner. So without further ado, we'll start by tackling the first challenge. Garab is gonna go through the challenges. Sounds good, thank you, Gil. Um, so yeah, uh, let's talk about some challenges that most marketers face in you know, running paid ads, or you know, even ads in general, but more specifically, we'll talk about paid ads today. Um, so we all want leads that convert at a higher rate. However, um, leads that convert to sales at a higher rate is usually a very small portion of your marketing funnel. I think Gil alluded to this uh, right, right before coming into the slide as well. And more often than not, a large portion of these high converting leads are your BOFU or what I call bottom of the funnel leads. But there's a challenge here. Bottom of the funnel, lead, bottom of the funnel leads, such as uh, people requesting free trials, requesting a demo, or trying to talk to sales are few and far in between. This usually makes up a very small portion of your overall pipeline, especially in the paid section. And the majority of your volume these days is coming from TOEFL leads, which is top of the funnel leads, leads like white paper downloads, eBooks, webinars, which could be considered somewhat you know, middle of the funnel. Uh, and, if you, and you basically have to do a lot of work here on these leads to get these folks to convert and be sales ready as high as your bottom of the funnel leads. So most marketers ask themselves the question, hey, what do I do with these TOEFL leads and how do I get them to be more sales ready so they you know, start converting at a, at, a, at a much higher rate as my bottom of the funnel leads do? So you know, we ask ourselves, should we not pass these over to the SDRs yet? Should I put them through a drip campaign where I will try, them, where I will try to get them to a higher state of sales readiness? Um, or should we figure out how we can find the segment and this volume that has the highest chance of converting today without really you know, let, letting them sit in the database and get old? Because in reality, the highest chance I have of converting them is within the next 24 hours of them engaging with you, right? And I personally think that the latter is a better option. While I'm not suggesting that uh, that you know you should not do drip campaigns. Drip campaigns are great, but at the same time, you don't want to let a drip campaign stop you from letting your SDR speak speak to these top of the funnel leads. So we have, you know, how, how you know, however, doing doing the doing uh, finding the segment in this top of the funnel volume that has a high chance to convert can be a hard task to to uh, to accomplish. Uh, one thing more I've seen mark, you know marketers do is they will quickly revert back to their marketing forms or landing pages and figure out how they can add more filters, ask for more information, introduce more fields. Uh, but in doing so, you're driving up sometimes cost and lowering volume and running the you know, risk of lower conversion because you're asking a lot of questions. Second option is, you know, how can I take you know, the insights and uh, attributes from my bottom of the funnel leads that are converting at a higher rate and apply them to my tofu uh, lead pool and basically help finding the little section that has a higher chance of converting. But to get this data, your CRM and marketing automation must be in top shape and you better have a repeatable, consistent, uh, structured way of getting insights from your sales team as well. Now, we all know that you know, that's super hard. Uh, even in organizations that have a very tight knit between marketing and sales organizations. And let's say even if you are able to somehow get this information back from your sales team in a repeatable man ma manner, it is quite hard for marketers to then structure this data and make it useful such that you can apply it to your marketing programs in a repeatable fashion. So however you look you look at it, it's a ton of work and it's very hard to get your top of the funnel leads to perform as well as your bottom of the funnel leads. I'll let Gil go over to the next slide. So the next challenge we want to, uh, to cover here, um, other than uh, the, the obvious BOFU, TOFU challenge that, that Gaurav just went through, is the disconnected workflow. You guys are, are using a plethora of, of tools today. You're using you know, a CRM that you installed, like a Salesforce or a base CRM, Microsoft Dynamics. You're using um, you know, a marketing automation tool, like a Marketo or Eloqua or HubSpot. 
you're using perhaps a landing page tool like an Unbounce or Lead Pages, you're using Google AdWords, Facebook Lead Gen, you know, LinkedIn, um, many, many different tools. You're probably sourcing some contacts, you, you purchase them from like a data or an inside view or, um, um, you know, or, or, or Zoom Info. Uh, so how do you actually make all those tools work together? Today, what is likely is happening is that you're getting a tool, like a buyer insights tool that can scan your, your sales force and come up with your, your buyer persona. And then you have to export the information for the buyer insight, and then you have to import it into the tool that you're generating the data from. Then you have to take those companies that you've generated, you have to import them into another tool that gives you contacts, and you have to export it from there. You have to import it into uh, Facebook or Twitter if you want to create a custom audience. You have to take the tags, take the UTM tags, apply them to the links. You have to do a lot of manual work to put those, uh, to put one campaign together, really. You have many, many different components, many different assets. Um, and the problem when you do export, import, export, import is that there is no consistent flow of data from point A until the end of it, meaning when an opportunity or when a booking is done. And so at the end of the day, when you are generating, let's say your sales counterpart just closed a $5 million deal, closed one within a month, you're very happy and you're trying to find out, is this my lead? How exactly does this lead come into place? What channel did it come from? What creative did it click on? Did it click on? What channel? What campaign were they sourced from? What audience did they, um, did they appear from? So and so forth. Yes, you may be able to, to find some of that information using the lead source um, or, or buying tools like full, full circle or, you know, or applying UTM tags or using Google key. Uh, Google Tag Manager, you can apply a few solutions that will help you um, solve some of, these in, some of these challenges. However, the big challenge is that the data doesn't flow in such a way that you can accurately say, okay, this lead was generated by this program at that time, and it was sourced from this particular audience, because even if you're running one too many uh, campaign, it's very hard for you to know granularly what particular experiment within that campaign that lead was, was sourced from. And if you are running a large campaign that goes after everyone, you can't really replicate that success. You have to spend the same $5,000, $3,000 that you spend on the entire campaign in order to maybe see a similar result. However, if you run smaller experiments, there is much better chance for you to have a smaller experiment, smaller budget, and then particularly understand the segment of that experiment that yield the positive ROI, and then really put the final most of your budget towards that experiment. And then Great. the second piece uh, of the puzzle is the 2080 rule that I'll let uh, Gaurav cover. Sounds good. Thanks, Gil. Um, and exactly, you know, to the last slide, you explaining the pain of, uh, you know, uh, disconnected, you know, systems. I can actually attest to this pain myself. In fact, I think most data-driven marketers today feel this pain all day long, especially when they really want to dig down deep and understand their marketing funnel and lead life cycle. There's so many ways you can cut your marketing funnel into different ways. You can look at, you know, your uh, your lead life cycle by subject of, uh, you know, the offers that you're putting out. You can look at it by channels. You know, uh, you, can you can look at it by origin, like exactly where the ad is running. There's so many different ways that you can look at this information. However, the challenge most of us run into uh, is one that, you know, Gil talked about in this last uh, slide. Uh, Gil, can you move over to the next slide? Thank you. And uh, one issue is, uh, that your impression to clicks data usually sits in third party channels that you're using, uh, like LinkedIn, like Twitter, where you're actually running the ads, right? The ad performance data is sitting there. Your impressions to clicks data is sitting there. Uh, but your clicks to leads to MQLs is usually in your marketing automation systems. And then lastly, your MQLs to uh, sales qualified leads to your closed one or closed lost uh, is in your CRM systems. So marrying this data, gathering it, and bringing it together for any sort of analysis can be quite a tough and you know, cumbersome task. 
uh, for any marketer. Hence, it, it makes uh, you know, uh, it really hard and time-consuming to do this kind of in-depth analysis on a regular basis and keep finding that 20% segment that's creating 80% of more of off their pipeline. Uh, most companies uh, do this in a ad hoc manner, usually, man usually manually uh, on, on top of that. Uh, B, they, uh, you know, data all, almost in all cases is fragmented and sits in silos unless you have invested a lot of uh, money and huge sums uh, into a BI tool or a centralized database system for which you also need res res resources internally to put together. Uh, lastly, if you are a data scientist or experienced analyst and a marketing gen genius all in one, it will be very hard to build models that iterate uh, as you go. And the reason why that's important uh, is because you want, because you're, as a business, as, as time goes on, your business is constantly evolving and you're learning more and more things. So you want to build models that iterate based on uh, the number of deals you're closing or not close, clo closing. It should be a smart system, not only done, this exercise should not be done just once or twice a year. If you really want to run smart, uh, and effective pipelines and a marketing and sales funnel, you have to do this uh, repeatedly at least once a quarter. But it is very hard to do. And this is where I believe machine learning applications for marketing uh, can really help. Not only help you find and enrich that 20% segment uh, that has the highest chance of generating revenue, but to go a step beyond and also programmatically help you find and target more of that segment on the internet or the different marketing channels and programs that you're using today. Uh, Gil, you can go to the next slide. Fantastic. So we've covered the, the challenges. Um, you know, we think that the 2080 rule is very hard and very important. Um, and we think that uh, tackling that challenge and finding that 2080 uh, segment will can actually revive your, your marketing. So before we jump into the particular models and examples, let's cover a quick example of, or explanation of what is machine learning. And that's kind of a, a sentence I, I grasped from one of the articles I read recently. Machine learning is essentially a subset of artificial intelligence in which the computer is trying to learn from, from past experience. And in this particular example, past experience is data, data collected. Once it's trying to learn from that data collected, it combines it with algorithms. In this particular example, we're talking about naive base, but there are also random forest, regression, k-means clustering, and many different statistical and alg statistical functions in different algorithms that essentially deliver you the final results. Usually, these are numeric results that you can uh, gather insights from. And the stages are kind of four stages, where Garab was talking about it before. You know, the marketing and sales, structuring the feedback from sales and putting it in a structured format, taking that data and building a model around it and training that model based on that data, applying that model to new data, and then capturing feedback, and then doing it all over again. In our particular example, when we talk about uh, the data, we're really talking about data that is already you guys are already sitting on top of. As demand generation managers and marketing managers, you're using Salesforce, you're using Marketo, you're using Unbounce, using Google AdWords, Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads, so on and so forth, each and every one of those tools are generating data. The thing is that data resides within those channels. Salesforce data resides in Salesforce, Marketo data resides in Marketo, Facebook data resides in Facebook, and unless you pull it out, structure it, and put it in one unified format, it's going to forever be in a silo. Our advice is take it out, take it out in chunks. You don't have to take everything at once. Take it out in chunks, put it together in a way that you can start gathering some insight, and then run some models to see what types of insights, actionable, actionable insights, you can gather from them so that you can run much more effective marketing programs. Otherwise, you're kind of walking blindly. So let's tackle the first, um, the first example. In this particular example, we want to show how to reduce the the signal to noise ratio and do it by connecting your marketing stack to one unified data source. There are many solutions out there today in which you can connect all of your marketing stack, those tools that I was mentioning before, into one unified resource like metadata. 
And then how do you actually identify the signals and associated patterns? So how do you understand what is important, what is not important, what is positive, what is false positive? And then identify the pattern and the source that led to that particular pattern. It's very easy to do it using machine learning. It's also possible to do it using some statistics if you know what to use. In this particular two examples, um, I've used kind of a combination and I'll show you exactly what I've done and what the value that I gathered from it. Let's look at the first example. In this first example, the, the value that you get out of this exercise, and I'll delve into this exercise in a second, but the value and the benefit that you're getting out of it is identifying the audiences that really convert into paid customers. You're generating, let's say, 500 leads or 100 leads a month. What are the 20 leads that your sales counterpart, when they see them in Salesforce or when they see them as a, as a new hot lead, they are super excited because based on their intuition, based on their past experience, they know this is a qualified meeting, this is a qualified lead that is likely to convert into an opportunity. In this particular example, the way I'm going to identify and focus that, that particular audience, that Pareto rule, is by combining first and third party data and then doing some basic analysis. So when I say first party data, what I mean is data that you collect already using the applications that you're using internally. For example, in this particular case, it's Salesforce and it's Marketo. Marketing automation saves things like all the leads that come into your website, all the form submissions, all the anonymous visits, what particular emails did they open, click, how long did they stay in a webinar, if you connected with the or some other tool, so on and so forth. And then we have the Salesforce um, data. That is very kind of opportunity and booking related. All the contacts, all the opportunities, all the leads and all the accounts um, that are stored in your Salesforce. You can quickly see what leads have translated into opportunities and into bookings and what leads never materialized. And then when I talk about third-party data, I'm talking about data that is not residing within you, meaning you did not collect that data. However, you can buy and purchase that data from third-party vendors, like ZoomInfo, DataNize, InsideView. Um, there are many, many AG data. There are many, many different data sources that each provide you a different type of information, or you can use multiple data sources, even provide you similar information, but each cover a different part of the market. So in this particular example, what I've done is I paired together the Marketo data with Salesforce data in order to understand what type of leads really convert into opportunities. And then I try to answer two questions. The first question is, what makes or breaks an ideal customer? Meaning, what type of signal, not even going into the attributions yet, what types of signals give me an idea that this is going to be a good client, a good prospect? And in this particular example, and I only show kind of small part of the analysis, so not to overwhelm um, you know, myself or, or, or you. In this example, you can see that skill set, groups, job titles, and if you keep going, you'll see technologies and many other uh, columns. Each and every one of those columns um, is a signal, is a type of signal, like an industry. So the industry of the company is a type of signal. And this particular screen right here shows us the profiling signals. It tells us that virtualization, for example, is a skill that has a very heavy weight to determine whether a lead is going to be a good prospect or not a good prospect. The group they belong to, perhaps the professional group they belong to on LinkedIn, that might also determine for us whether someone is going to be relevant to us based on historical data or not as important. Job titles, you know, it could be the industry they come from, uh, it could be the size of the company, technologies they're using, keywords that they're looking for. It could even be, um, you know, and you should be kind of open to it and agnostic to, to the results because you might be surprised. Sometimes the gender might be relevant, the age, the salary of that person, um, so on and so forth. And so the first question is answered right here, and that is, what signals make or break an ideal client? And then I went to one, one level uh, deeper, and I tried to understand what particular, given that we know what signals are important, what particular attributes make or break a good customer? So if an industry is important, tell me exactly what is the most important industry I should go after. And give me a visual so that I can compare um, apples to apples. If 
uh, and industry is important, then tell me how important is it for me to go after the IT industry versus ad tech, or how important is it to go for me after the owner versus the CTO, or if it's technologies or if it's side of the company, really let me help me focus on the small particular segment that you know is very successful. Now, when you run clustering, you may end up with more than one profile, meaning you may end up with a few groups. That each of them have a certain number of attributes. So maybe you are selling one product, but you're actually but you're actually selling two flavors of that of that product. One of them is for enterprise, and one of them is for maybe SMBs. And so for the enterprise, you may see that job titles um, and and uh, and groups and size of the company is very important. And then maybe for, for another segment, you'll find different signals. And of course, the attributes will be different. And it's okay because they're tackling different segments and different uh, products that you're selling. And so kind of be open to it, run some, some experimentation, and then share those results with, with your sales counterpart. Your sales organization usually has what we call knowledge of the tribe. They have done this before intuitively. They have a lot of experience selling to your, to your prospects. They're actually in the field closing deals, and so they can give you a lot of feedback um, for your analysis. Also, your analysis represents a general theory and, and hypothesis. You can get the hypothesis and actually run this with contacts and companies and see what types of companies, what types of contacts in the market fit into this particular criteria. And you can take those particular companies and contacts and share those with your sales counterpart, and then they don't have to guess using their intuition. They can tell you, yes, if you were to get me this particular persona within these particular companies, I will guarantee that 20% of those calls will turn into opportunities. So that's the first exercise that we've done through here. Yeah, Gil, and uh, I would like to quickly chime in here really quickly as well, right? Um, I, you're absolutely right. I think third-party data could be very useful. And like you said, CRM, your CRM only has the amount of information that your marketing and sales pro pro programs and teams are feeding it, right? But when coupled with third-party data uh, that you do not have today, you can actually unlock some great insights, right, uh, for your buyer seg seg segments. So let me give you a really quick example here. Uh, so for one, one thing that was quite useful for us was actually the uh, technology piece. And it's not only helpful to let your sales team know, um, you, you know, um, how to win these deals more by, by, you know, by coupling it with third-party data, but also sometimes we use the technology piece as a heads up, so that the salespeople could be uh, more prepared on those calls if they knew that the uh, opportunity that they are getting is using a complementary technology, uh, or they are using a competitive technology. And in each of those two cases, their pitches look very, very different. So that was one benefit. Uh, the second benefit was uh, just what certain when when we saw a certain mix of technologies being used by a certain segment, we were able to see patterns that you know when company X is using Y technologies, they tend to make better uh, customers for us, especially in the case of the complementary te you know uh, technology being used. So that particular use case by itself uh, was very helpful, and we actually had the, our, our sales team come back to us and say thanks many, many times over, saying that, hey, this information is great to have, and not only allows them to have some insight prior to going into that call, but also gives them a chance of knowing which deals they should prioritize over the others. Awesome. Thank you, Gaurav, for that example. Second example I wanted to go through is running some experiments and being able to analyze uh, the results of your experiments and running agile marketing. So in this particular example, the benefit is, before I delve into the actual analysis, is predicting your pipeline and using your market budget, marketing budget effectively. And what I mean by that is instead of doing what we call is a waterfall, like in, in, in software engineering we have this term, waterfall versus agile, right? Like the waterfall is you do a lot of planning, estimations, uh, put, a, put a big program ahead of time and then go through with it, where Agile is kind of a little bit less, less known, um, but you can quickly iterate and quickly understand based on, on, your, on your previous sprints and previous results uh, what is the next, next step forward. And so we recommend that you really give a, a nice chunk of percentage of your, of your marketing budget and your, and your time 
into running marketing experiments and then reiterate based on that. And how do we recommend that you do that? First of all, the basic rule is unify your data. Take your data, in this particular example, I'm pairing my data from marketing automation, from Salesforce and other CRMs, and then um, my advertising campaign, so Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, particularly on, on, on social media. And what is, my, what is my intent here? My intent here is to understand from all the experiments that, that I'm doing, what are the ones that are yielding the best leads, those that convert into opportunities, those that my sales counterparts have already looked into and told me, awesome leads, give me more of these. And then I can eliminate those that didn't yield the good leads and really focus on those that are very high ROI. So how did they do that? In this particular example, you can see those small UIDs here, these each represent one experiment. And what you can see on the right-hand side are um, all the different uh, results of those. So for example, you can see how much this total experiment cost me. So we recommend that instead of running one Facebook campaign with $3,000 budget, letting that campaign run and burn through your cash, either it's successful and then you're amazing, or it's a failure and then you went through $3,000 budget burn. We recommend to break it down. Break it into 10 experiments, into 20 experiments of, of $150 each. Let those experiments really compete with one another and see what, which one yields the best leads. And the best leads meaning those in, in, that convert into opportunities, those that get the highest scores within your marketing automation if you have a lead scoring uh, set up, and those that came, with a rel that, that came affordable with a relatively low cost per lead. And now how do you run experiments? What is experiment, experimental marketing? What I mean by that is every paid ad campaign that you're running has multiple components, right? It has the offer that you have in place, that ebook, the white paper analyst guide. It could be a webinar like the one we're having right now. So there is an offer, a particular offer that you're, that you're giving someone. One person might like offer number one, and a different persona might, may like offer number two. And that brings me to the second point, the audience. Who are you promoting this asset to? If you're promoting a total cost of ownership white paper, you better not give it to your user, to the person who is going to use your product. They don't care about the TCO. However, you may want to give the TCO white paper to your VP of engineering or to your controller or VP finance. They really do care about the budgeting. Then maybe you have uh, an architecture diagram. Maybe the CTO cares about that. So you really want to mix and match the offer that you have with the particular audiences that you're going after. And then you have the channels. Do you think your, your, um, your audiences hang out in a particular social media website? Do you think they go to the particular website? You know, you can, you can target your white paper to a list of 100 particular um, websites today using programmatic marketing tools like metadata. You should really figure out what channel you're going after with a particular promotional offer. Then you want to understand what messaging you're putting out there. It could be that you have the best white paper in the world, but if your message, the, the small text that comes together with it, when people have to click and download it, is not residing well with them, you have to change it. So you maybe want to put three or four different messages to see which one resides, uh, resonates best with your audience. And then finally, you have the creative. That's just another component. Do you have the right thumbnail there? Do you have the right picture? Um, you know, perhaps you want to associate a picture with the, with the company you're going after. Maybe you want to personalize your ad. There are many, many ways to do it. Our recommendation, if you leave with one thing here, is do some multivariant testing. You have all those different components that make a campaign. Create many experiments using those components. So try this audience on this channel. Try a different audience on the same channel. Try that audience on a different channel using a different creative, different text. Try different offers, so try to push that white paper five times to that particular persona, that's fine. If they don't resonate and they saw that, that, um, you know, that, that particular offer five or ten times and they didn't click, maybe you can switch out a different, a different offer. Maybe they care about a different particular offer more. So in this particular experiment, I highlighted in green those that generated and yield the best leads for me. On, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see zero means no leads. So all of them really generated leads, or at least the ones I'm showing here. I'm sure the one, there were experiments that didn't yield any leads. But those that, that yield um, you know, a one or a two or even a three really are failures, meaning they generated leads that no one really cared about that much. Yeah, they were nice. Maybe they had some interest. Maybe they, they weren't even students. Maybe they were even actual you know, professionals working in companies that I want to sell to. But still, 
they were not showing as leads that are likely to translate into opportunities, and so they are not ranked high. However, the fours and the five, those are good leads. Those are leads that my sales counterpart or my marketing automation based on historical data have determined that are good leads that are likely to convert into opportunities. So what we call sales qualified leads. You want to generate more of these. I can see what channel they came from. I can see what type of ad they came from. I can see what particular uh, campaign and offer they came from, what version of the creative they, cl they, they clicked on, so on and so forth. There are many more moving pieces, and I, saw, and I kept all of them. The reason I kept all of them is because I wanted to understand what particular experiment within my 5060 experiment yielded the highest ROI, and then eliminate anything else and focus only on those experiments. And then next week, generate more experiments that look similar to those successful experiments and do it all over again. There are two benefits to doing this. One, your sales counterpart is going to love you because you're going to generate less leads, but you're going to generate significantly better leads. There is no uh, pain in, vo in volume here, meaning it doesn't mean that maybe in the beginning you were generating a little bit less leads because you're being a little bit more careful, but very quickly, once you understand your, your sweet spot, you can actually push the budget as much as you want, and therefore, therefore you can get the volume up to where it needs to be. The second benefit, and it's very important benefit, mostly to your executive, is predictability. Once you understand what budget generates what types of leads, in what types of ratio and conversion rates, you can actually determine your pipeline. You can go to your sales counterpart, you can go to your CEO and say, okay, based on our goals, we need to generate $3 million worth of pipeline this quarter. I need to generate 760 leads that are going to convert into 630 MQLs that are going to generate, you know, 200 opportunities, and those are going to convert into 30, 30 bookings or so. You can give it a little bit of buffer to, to mitigate your risk. And there you have it. You now have a pipeline that everyone can rely on. And you know that if you push the budget up or down, you can actually control that volume. So a big benefit in running experimental marketing, we highly recommend it. Um, and if you can do it automatically without actually getting into the, into the manual labor of putting tags, putting UTMs, doing the data analysis, uh, scoring, uh, doing multivariate testing, all that good stuff, all the better. So Joe, can you actually go back to the last slide? I would like to mention please. something there. Yeah, of one, one, one additional benefit of running it uh, the way that Gil described is that it also gives you, uh, you know, especially demand gen man, man, managers, a lot of ammunition to go back to uh, your counterpart in product marketing or your content marketing manager and give them reasons to build specific kinds of content, right? Because you can see over time which types of contents per produce the most amount of revenue. That way, if you have data like this, you can always go back to them and ask them to create or give them reasons to create more of a particular type of con content. The second thing that I kinda, uh, want, want to quickly touch upon is, you know, yes, running these small tests, uh, you know, and, and as many num number of you know, tests is super important. But also one thing that you should keep in mind that in practical life, this can sometimes be very hard for marketers to, to, to execute manually and without the help of any software help. Uh, depending on the size of your team, uh, you sometimes need a full-time employee to manage this um, and, and run on their own. But if, you help, but if you have a help of a software that can programmatically do this for, for you, you can run the amount of tests you were going to run maybe in a quarter or six months in, in a matter of months. In, in, a, in, a, in a matter of like one month or so. So uh, if done right, you can definitely yield some great results and a lot of amazing insights that not, not only will, will, will help you in doing more effective marketing, but also make your sales a lot more effective as well. Awesome points from the field. Thank you, Gaurav. Cool. So let's move into the conclusions part. So we've established that 2080 rule exists in marketing like everywhere else, and less can be more. Instead of doing a big spray and pray, you really want to focus on those segments, on those particular experiments that yield the highest ROI for you. And you better do it today before your competition does. Second part is identifying the segments, although very important, can be tough. You have to manually get feedback. You have to put yourself in a vulnerable place with your sales counterpart and may have to hear that vast majority of your leads are crap and they're not actually converting into deals. And you may have to do some manual work and take that feedback and put it in a structured format. And then you may have to clean some of that data and generate some insight. Maybe you have to hire someone to help you with the data analysis, or maybe you have to 
um, hire the services of the company or or buy a software like uh, like like what we provide or some other software in the market that helps you do multivariate testing and data analysis. Then finally, you have to connect all of your software into one place. Otherwise, they don't talk to one another. And if they don't talk to one another, doing a manual import export leads to an unoptimized process. Third thing is that you may want to build some um, some agile experiments, some some marketing experiments that instead of doing one big one-to-many campaign that may generate the good results, maybe not, you may want to uh, generate many, many small experiments that each yield perhaps different results and then sort between the results and prioritize and try to understand exactly what is good, what was working, what wasn't working in order to focus on those that yield the best, uh, the best ROI. So definitely agile marketing and data-driven experiments we recommend is one of the most effective ways to guarantee the successfulness of your marketing programs. So without further ado, and I already see, I already see a bunch of questions in the, in the Q&A window, we're going to tackle um, the questions one by one and start answering them. So I'm going to pause the sharing here for one moment. Nate, feel free to, uh, to start reading out the questions uh, and we'll tackle them one by one. Sure, I see one here. So um, it says, our sales team generates their own leads using data.com and RainKing. Um, how do you account for this behavior in revenue attribution and how should uh, activity data help to provide weights? So um, data.com, data nice, zoom in for inside view, uh, discover org, many of those data sources provide um, contact databases, right? Uh, sometimes there's kind of a little bit of confusion between the, the word lead and, and the word uh, contact. Uh, for me at least, um, a lead is, is usually an opt-in, someone that raised their hand and, uh, and, and said that they're interested in, in contacting the company. Um, However, a contact, even a cold contact, if we know it's the right person, um, it's, it's a good practice to, to sift through contacts and, and source some of these contacts. Uh, it's a little bit more outbound, a little bit more spammy way to, to, go after, to go after prospects. However, a legitimate way, I would say 95% of the companies um, use that methodology. Uh, what I propose to do is when you, when you um, when you source leads from, from a ranking or from, a, from data.com, instead of, um, instead of thinking about getting a very large volume of contacts because maybe your license allows you to and importing all of them to your HubSpot and starting to run some, some email cadences, try to do something different. And even here, try to be a little bit more experimental. So take a small chunk of your, of your data.com uh, contacts, maybe a thousand of them, maybe 500 of them, and see, start doing some A-B testing. Maybe take a thousand of those contacts Divide them into five segments based on job title, based on industry, um, you know, size of company, you know, whatever you, you think are the right signals for you. If you or if you want to go through the experiment I went before, you can actually see exactly what segments you should go after, and then run personalized campaigns to each and every one of those segments and see which one yielded the highest ROI for you. So just like I did before, yes, we're not talking about paid ads campaign, we're not talking about many different components. Really, we're talking about an email, so it's a subject and a text and maybe a call to action and then the segment that you're going after, use that to, to run four or five experiments and see which one yields the highest, uh, the highest ROI. I think buying uh, data is good and is important if, if it's done well. If it's just for the sense of, you know, filling your, your marketing automation and your, your outbound tool with, lar with large contacts so that you can, you can report those to your executives, um, I, I, would, I would walk away from that one. Thanks. Um, got another question here uh, asking, uh, can I connect marketing automation tools as well, things like uh, the Adobe Marketing Cloud? Garv, would you like to take that or should I? Uh, go, go ahead and take that one. Okay. So, yeah, Adobe Marketing Cloud, Oracle Marketing Cloud, um, all of these different tools uh, are certainly viable and you can use them to connect all of your tools to them. Um, maybe some of those tools already have native integration that were done internally. Uh, if they don't, you can use tools like um, 
cloud types like Zapier, or you can just build up your own webhooks to uh, to send you know get you know get and send data from them. Today, I would say vast majority of the tools are using um, RESTful API and webhooks, and so they always have the opportunity. Like for example, Marketo, even if they don't have a particular connection to Marketo, Marketo allows you to create any webhook to any tool, and so. Unless those tools were done in like, you know, developed in the 80s and 90s and they were not modernized since, uh, they all allow you to, do, to create a webhook and, and import, uh, and sorry, and send data in between them. Uh, if they're not, those tools like Zapier will actually allow you to create one like that. So we actually recently, with metadata, we had a particular CRM, uh, on-premise CRM, I should say, of one of our clients, and they really wanted to work with us, and we told them there's no native integration, and actually Zapier and CloudPipes and any of, that, of those solutions also didn't have the solution. However, Zapier has a small SDK that allows you, and we took us maybe a few weeks, to build a connector to it that completely um, you know, allowed us to get and send data from that particular CRM, and it worked wonderfully. So I would say generally, yes, today you can connect any tool to any tool. Yeah, I think, uh, Gil, between Zapier and Webhooks, I think most modern tools would be covered. Fantastic. All right, um, another question here. Uh, so this person has a relatively small number of large enterprise deals. and says, I'm concerned that analyzing these deals may lead to false positives. What's the best way to measure confidence in the results from machine learning analysis? That's a great question. So, you know, one of the best ways, uh, or I would say one of the classic ways to run machine learning is to take a small portion of your data, some of it is positive, some of it is false positive, run a model, and then compare the results that the model gets to the actual results you already know actually reside, meaning you already have the historical data, you're actually just kind of checking or testing the computer, if you will, to see if the model um, is going to be successful. The confidence level in general is based on the maturity of the model and then how much data was it based on. The longer you run the model, the better and the higher the confidence. Um, the, more, the more coverage you have, the more results you actually have, so not only the inputs but also the output, the more the computer can go into it, try to see if it got the right result. If it did, great. It's coming back to you with this, this the model that works. If it didn't, then it's going to try something else. And so I would say in your particular case, if you have a lot of data um, and your deals are, are diverse, try to, um, to take a small portion of that data, maybe 20% of that data. Also take 20% of that data that you know, um, you know um, has some false positives in it, meaning let's say you're, you're, ta you're tackling particular, you're, you're mentioning CRM data, so take the 20% of the, of the best opportunities that you have or good opportunities that you have. Also take 20% of the lead that you have that didn't translate into any opportunities, and then let a computer understand, okay, this is positive, these were the kind of leads that translated into mature business, these were the kind of leads that translated and converted into nothing, and now go ahead and run a model and try to infer um, what to go after and how to build that model. That's essentially the essence of, of, of machine learning and statistics, and so you can use that, those data points um, to run those models. Okay, cool. Um, one more question here got about lead scoring. So we currently score our leads based on behavior only. Um, should we mix demographics data with it or have a separate scoring for things like industry or technology use? Um, I would say all, all of the above. Um, and Gaurav, you may, you may chime in here. I know you've done a good amount of, of lead scoring uh, at user voice. I would say from my experience, um, combining them is, is a good idea. Um, if you know that particular, and I would say even segmenting them as much as possible within your contacts in your marketing automation. So I used to have, um, you know, in my marketing automation, where I still have it to this date, many separate segments based on industry, based on job title, based on technologies, because each and every one of them are very relevant to particular offers. So when I have a new webinar, when I have a new white paper or a new case study, I really want to try as much as possible to uh, direct and promote that particular asset to the very, very relevant um, market segment within my, my prospect database. So yes and yes. I would say definitely if you think that, for example, if a prospect is 
currently using or previously used one of your competing technology, and that's a good determination whether it's a good prospect or she is a good prospect, yes, you should use some kind of a scoring to, um, uh, you know, to, to take a notion of that. If it's a particular industry that you're most successful with because you already sold to 50 companies within this particular niche, 100%. You want to, to raise the flag whenever you get the company from that particular uh, industry because you can talk about all those logos that you already have. You can talk about the experience that you have in there. Maybe you can talk about some of the results that you've generated for that particular industry. Maybe one of your sales counterparts who is focused on that industry wants to know that someone from that industry is now showing up as a prospect. So 100% I would recommend to combine those two together. All right. Um, one more question coming in here. Um, so this person, this company is just starting out their ad efforts and they've set up retargeting already, but they want to do more. Um, so they're asking, what indicators should I look for to determine the best channels, social networks, ad networks, text, images, video, et cetera? Yeah, uh, I can take that one, um, Nate. Uh, yeah, so if you've just set up retargeting, and but you want to do more, um, I, I, one, I, I, would de I would definitely say that don't just rely on retargeting. I think retargeting is a great tool for leads that, are, that is already in your system. Um, but I wouldn't just rely on retargeting. I would run a bunch of different channels at the same time. And always remember, like, you need to keep filling your pipeline with new leads as well. So running retargeting by itself is probably not the best approach. Uh, and secondly, to determine uh, which, uh, which things are working best, I mean, honestly, what you really need is a robust way to give attributions. Um, and different... You know, different people use different kinds of attribution systems. I have seen people use, uh, you know, uh, give 100% attribution to uh, the to the source that converts something to a lead. Other people use a more, uh, you know, weighted out uh, system where you know 40% of the attribution goes to the converted touch to lead, uh, the other 40% goes to the last touch, and everything else goes to in between uh, touches. But it really depends on how and what information you are collecting on a per lead basis and where you are collecting it and how efficiently your systems is collecting that, da that data, not only in your marketing automation, but also in your CRM system. Uh, and if you can then take that information out and do, do some kinds of, uh, kinds of analysis on, on it, not only by channel or origin, but, all, but, but also by, uh, you know, um, the subject matter of the, of the content and the form in which you are putting out that content and ads, uh, then that's what's going to give you a good understanding of what channels are performing best for you or not. I'll just add to that and say that um, the channels sometimes can be agnostic if your targeting is very well determined, meaning many times when, when new clients uh, come to metadata and and we tell them, hey, we're going to run, we're going to start running paid ads for you on, on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter, and we're also going to run them on programmatic display advertising. They're, they're asking us, oh, you know, and every client has their own kind of stories. Oh, you know, I've tried Facebook ads, they didn't work. Oh, I've tried LinkedIn ads, they're too expensive, they don't convert. Oh, I tried, you know, doing targeting on AppNexus or, or other display networks and it didn't work out. I tell them, forget about your previous history because you may have used that particular channel's criteria to target your audiences. What we're doing, or what you should be doing, you know, independently, even if you don't work with metadata, is generate a particular audience, especially in B2B. You have a very predetermined total addressable market, named account that you're going after, particular persona, four or five people that in every sales cycle you need to tap to touch if you want to close a deal. So go and source that particular list of companies, maybe 10,000 companies, maybe 20,000 companies. Go find those four or five people within those companies, those 20,000 companies you should go after, and source their email, their hashed email, source their mobile device ID, their cookie, their IP address, and then target those particular people within those particular companies. And then when you know you're targeting those particular people and companies, it doesn't matter where you target them. That's where the retargeting comes into place. Retargeting is targeting people that are already been to your website, and you know you're going to go after them any other website that they go after. In this particular example, you're doing retargeting without the lead. You're targeting the right people that you know you should, you would love to get them converted, even if they never visited your website, and you're targeting them everywhere they go, whether they're on Facebook because they're checking their 
kids' uh, profile, whether they're on Twitter because they're looking into a blog post, or whether they're on ESPN watching a game. You want to show your ad and get them to click on it, see your white paper, download it, and then convert into an opt-in lead. Yeah, Gil, that, that is a great point. And, and I think account-based marketing could be very, very useful, especially when, you, when your sales cycles are longer than two or three months and your ACVs are uh, north of like $30,000, $20,000 a year. So the longer your sales cycles, the higher up you're going in the, in the, in the enterprise stack. Uh, account-based mar- marketing, just, just like Gil described, could be a very, very u- u- useful marketing technique. All right, <clears throat> thanks. Um, just a quick note, if you have any questions about um, either metadata or WorkSpan, uh, um, definitely invite you to either reach out to either our speakers directly or um, you know, feel free to, to send me an email through um, you know, your WebEx and just respond to those. Um, in the interest of time, I think we got to wrap up and, and move to the attribution templates. So uh, I guess I'll pass it back to you. 100%, Garo, take it away. Yeah, can you move on to the next slide? Of course. Awesome. Thank, thank you, guys. So uh, this is a BI dashboard template. Uh, of course, you're not seeing it on the screen here. But uh, if you click on that link or just uh, uh, just use that link, uh, the tiny URL link, it, it will take you uh, to this attribution uh, or this BI dashboard template that I've built. And the motivation behind this template is quite simple. I just wanted a quick and easy way to update uh, my CMO, my COO, my CEO even on a weekly basis and let them know exactly how the marketing team is doing against their goals. And because we were in a pretty unique setup where where marketing owned everything from impressions all the way to leads to MQLs, but to qualified opportunities we handed off to sales, I wanted an easy way to show them exactly how we're doing across that funnel and our goals as well. So I've just built this basically a simple temp- template. You can use it, it it's plug and play. Uh, you can customize it to your own marketing and sales funnel as well. And uh, it will, uh, once you input the information in the second tab, it will uh, spit out a beautiful graph that you can uh, share with your uh, team and your higher ups on a weekly basis. It's worked very well for me. I hope you like it. And if you, have, if you guys have any questions, uh, my information is on this slide deck. Feel free to reach out to me as well. Thank you very much, Gaurav. And I, I can attest with that attribution model. We've been using some of that within our product. So, guys, um, this is kind of the end of the hour. I wanted to um, thank all of you for, for joining us for today's webinar. We're going to have a series of these webinars uh, going forward to talk about data-driven marketing, account-based marketing, and uh, agile marketing. And so if you're interested in this subject and you want to kind of take your marketing to the next level and apply some computer science and artificial intelligence into it, I welcome you to join us. Thank you again, Gaurav, for joining us. Uh, You've been a wonderful co-speaker. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Gil. Thank you, everyone.